thanks for joining. We've had a good day so far, I think. And we'll... well, it sounds like it, judging by the, 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 the conversation I've just heard in the last 10 minutes. And I must say, I mean, if, if I can comment on that, um, Richard, you made a really important point about how our, our sister parties have not been faring in other countries. And there are bigger, bigger forces, bigger trends at play than just what we think about what's happening in the UK. And I, I think that's very, very important indeed. Um, and I agree with Julia, but we, we, of course we have to inspire and encourage the young. But our, our problem is at the other end of the age spectrum. Um, I mean, that was evident in the vote on Brexit. It's certainly evident in the vote on the general election. And it's our task is how you put together a winning coalition, because that's Labour always has to put together a winning coalition to form a government. That's what our history has taught us. Am I on your screen now, Mike? Can you, you see are me? On screen. I... You are on the screen, yes. So I will, I will leave okay. you through in a second. So you've got basically okay. a free reign. And we've got, so we're aiming to finish okay. about three. But I mean, take as okay. much time as you like, and then we'll, we'll ask you some questions. Sure. Well, first of all, Mike and friends, thank you very much for inviting me. I know I, I'm not Jack Dromey, um, but it is a great pleasure to, to be here. I just wanted to reflect really on where we are and where we're heading and, and what it is we need to do. Um, I think all of us would feel that the, uh, or the current relationship, such as it is between the UK and the EU, is definitely not in a good place. Um, it absolutely suits the Prime Minister to have a continuing punch-up with the EU. You know, there's punch-ups he likes to have. Uh, the EU is one of them, the culture wars is another, and we are in, in difficulty, and, and the, the acute point of difficulty at the moment is, of course, the Northern Ireland Protocol where I worry a great deal about the impact it's having on the peace in Northern Ireland. Uh, I've long held, and I've said to some of you before when we've had these discussions, that I think it's perfectly possible to find a way through, but it does require some flexibility and common sense on both sides. And I, I think you, can, you could see that beginning to emerge because in its hardline position, the EU says the rules is the rules, you signed up for this, implement it in full. Well, uh, I think that's not quite the case. And for the Labour Party in the UK, we, we can't fall into the trap of saying, yeah, well, that's our view too. The rules is the rules. And I, I, let me take medicines as an example, because there's been briefing over recent months and particularly this week, excellent thread by Tony Connolly from RTE, who is uh, spectacularly well informed about what's happening uh, inside various negotiations, in which he said the EU has recognised that they can't uh, stand on what would be a literal interpretation of the Northern Ireland Protocol, which would be that any medicines used in Northern Ireland have to be certified by the EMA, and only those holding a licensing agreement who are based in either Northern Ireland or the rest of the EU um, can distribute the medicines. Because it is said that Mr. Sefcovich has said to the EU folk, look, uh, the UK has a national health service. And a national health service surely is able to send medicines required by patients of the national health service, wherever the patients happen to be, including in Northern Ireland. Now, that seems to me to be a perfect example of the kind of common sense flexibility that is required to deal with some of the problems we've got at the moment. And if you could do that on medicines, and it seems to me it is possible to do that on Sainsbury's supermarket lorries, which has become the great um, symbol of the row, along with uh, sausages, secondhand tractors and, and uh, seed potatoes. Now, we don't really know how things are progressing in detail in the joint committee. Uh, all we see are the briefings and the words and the verbal sparring between the principals uh, in public, but they've got to keep on working to find a way through because the overwhelming requirement is to take the temperature down in Northern Ireland. That is our, that must be our first objective. And the irony of all of this is that 
if things work out and people kind of get used to whatever the new arrangements are, and don't forget, uh, this question of goods at risk uh, is at the heart of the Northern Ireland Protocol. And if you're going to say there are goods at risk, you are, of course, saying there are goods that are not at risk of entering the European Union. And therefore, that of itself implies that there is the potential, the room for flexibility in how you apply the rules and the checks and so on. Because when Northern Ireland is able to step back from the current kerfuffle and look at the position it's found itself in as a result of the Northern Ireland Protocol, of course, Northern Ireland is in a really, really good position because it is unique in the United Kingdom in having access to both the European market and the UK market. And if investors get to the point where they believe that the Northern Ireland Protocol is here to stay at the moment, they don't believe that at all because the DUP is saying we want to get rid of it and the government is uh, saying it, it, it's not working, it's got to be changed, then of course the, the benefits that can flow to Northern Ireland will be very, very uh, considerable uh, indeed. So we've got to find a way through this. More generally, I, I um, together with others, set up this thing called the UK Trade and Business Commission uh, following the abolition of the Select Committee because a number of people, including some on this call, had suggested uh, we need to be able to continue to scrutinise what is happening. And we are, in effect, acting like a Select Committee, representatives of all of the parties in Parliament, uh, including all of the parties in Northern Ireland. And we meet on a fortnightly basis. We take evidence. Uh, they've been really interesting evidence sessions. If you are interested, you can tune in on a um, Thursday morning or you can read the transcripts, which the team puts together. And we've taken a lot of evidence on four or five sessions so far on how it's working at the moment, because our focus is we are where we are. Um, the transition period ended. We've got the TCA. We've got the Northern Ireland Protocol. We're trying to address what is the big question for all of us. You know, whatever happened in the past, however we feel about it, uh, and we all know how we feel about this decision and the impact that it's had on Britain's reputation in the world, our, our sense of European identity, uh, the, uh, the way in which it has perplexed our friends and our neighbours. The task now is what does the new relationship look like in the new circumstances? And that is what we've got to apply our mind to. And one of the good things about the TCA is it does specifically envisage further agreements being reached between the UK and the EU. So interpretation of the Northern Ireland Protocol is one. Uh, what are we going to do about uh, British artists, performance, sound technicians, musicians, opera singers? who as one are apoplectic with rage at what the lack of an agreement that takes accounts of their interests has done to their career prospects and their ability uh, to tour. And therefore the issue we need to address is, okay, so what could be done to allow them to tour in Europe and their fellow performers and artists and um, technical experts and others to come and perform in the UK? Uh, quid pro quo. Uh, we've got to keep a close eye on the settled status issue. Um, the deadline, of course, is coming up at the end of the month. The government has published, as you all know, a very long list of reasons that they probably would be prepared to accept a late application. Um, and I think they also understand, and if they don't, we have to make sure that we keep reminding them, there cannot be a, a repetition of uh, the Windrush scandal in respect of EU citizens. Because after all, we want EU citizens here to be treated exactly as we would expect UK citizens in the other member states to be treated when it comes to securing their long time, term rights to live and uh, to uh, work. Um, and the other issue is, we've got to keep an eye on this, those who've been granted pre-settled status are going to have to remember to apply for settled status when the five years, however long it, it, it takes them to get to five years with the Home Office satisfied, well, you've been here for five years, so now we can give you a full settled status. Because if people forget to apply, then they run the risk of losing their rights. And I've asked questions of ministers saying, are you going to remind people 
because it's really important that that is, and the, these things are going to occupy us for a quite uh, a long time. The bigger question, of course, is the political relationship between the EU and the UK, and the politics are very difficult on both sides at the moment. And I suppose the question is, at what point do we get beyond the current difficulties and a more pragmatic attitude uh, applies on both sides of the channel where what had to be proven by Brexit or what had to be proven by the decision of a member state to leave on both sides gives way to can we not pragmatically now build a new, a different kind of relationship and I see an incremental future in which we try and create a closer economic and political relationship with the other EU member states. There's no doubt in my mind at all that a Brexit has reduced our standing in the world. Uh, it's been very striking, although he's a very polite man, that uh, President Biden, through the uh, famous démarche of this week, has in effect told off Boris Johnson for his behaviour in respect of the Northern Ireland Protocol. And I was astonished in the negotiations that the UK never even asked for some mechanism for cooperation on foreign policy. Um, at the moment, we're in the corridor trying to listen through the keyhole, and that's a not a very good place to be when we know that every single one of the big issues that we have to confront, how do we deal with uh, Russia and its disruptive behavior in the short term? And, and for me, that is about credibility. Um, uh, when we say to Russia, uh, don't cross this line, whether it is the Baltic states, whether it is uh, Ukraine or other things, the, the even bigger long term question relationship with uh, China, trade, climate change, threats to peace and security, uh, the movement of people, the movement of uh, refugees, be they fleeing war, persecution, in search of a better life or environmental degradation in the place where they were born and brought up. And the reason why the argument for cooperation at a European level and an international level is never, ever, ever going to go away, despite the efforts of the Johnsons and the Trumps and others, is that it is the only hope we have as human beings to manage our way to a better future for the world. Because whether some people like it or not, we are in this together. We are neighbors on a small planet and we've got to work and to cooperate. And um, the Brexit vote was in part, in my view, about the balance between the national and the supra uh, national and balance sometimes has to be readjusted uh, in life. The, the art of politics is to find uh, the right balance, but that's where we should focus ourselves. We don't know how the EU is going to develop over the years ahead. I want it to thrive and to prosper. And I agree with you, Claire, that it will continue to do so. The, the, the charge, the warning of the Brexiteers that once we leave, there'll be a stampede to exit the European Union has proved not to be the case, not least because people look at the impact on Britain, the cost to businesses, small businesses in particular. Uh, it's really, really difficult for people. And don't forget, we haven't even started checking EU goods coming inwards. And in a way, I think, um, uh, I don't think that's helped uh, an argument for negotiating a better arrangement because it means that the EU businesses haven't yet experienced what those checks are going to be like as and when the UK starts to apply them fully. Uh, so it's, it's very asymmetric at the moment. But anyway, that's my assessment of where we are. We need to focus on specific issues in the short term to build a new and a different relationship in the longer term. And beyond that, uh, who knows what the future holds? Thanks, Mike. <laughs> Take myself off mute. Uh, thank you so much. That was uh, that was wonderful and insightful as always. And it's really good to hear a bit more detail about the commission that you are you're running. And it it's, uh, it sounds like a very very useful space. And I'm very glad that you're able to continue to do that work, even though the uh, the select committee is is no more. Um, right, questions for Hillary. Um, if you want to ask a question, you can um, raise a hand using the participants tab. Um, I can't see all of you, so don't just wave at me because I probably won't see it. Um, or you can um, put a question in the chat. Um, either would be fine. Um, I guess my first question to you, Hillary, would yeah. be 
kind of how you see Labour's policy developing. So since the reshuffle, I mean, Sharon Hodgson spoke out yesterday or the day before and was saying she thought that Labour should be a bit more, um, you know, bullish in its, um, you know, public uh, awareness raising as much as anything else of the impacts of Brexit. And Rachel Reeves, um, you know, made some efforts to do that in her first speech as Shadow Chancellor. So, I mean, do you see things developing over the summer and the autumn? Maybe as public awareness grows, as hopefully the pandemic continues to fade, or do you think Labour is, the, you know, the leadership is likely to wait a bit longer you know, before really launching in, um, to, you know, to, to allow public opinion to get used to the fact that things are not working out too well? It's a really uh, good and important question. I, I've said from the, the 1st of January, we should tuck in behind the experience of those who are facing difficulties because of what's happened. In other words, we are the people who amplify who pointed out and make proposals as to how it might be solved or the impact lessened that's what we should do and the fact that of course what the, the Tories want is to have a debate about is Labour going to campaign at the next election to rejoin the European Union well now has made it clear we're not uh, Ed Davey has made it clear we're not and rejoining the European Union and it may not be the view of everyone on on the call but uh as, a, as a, a political objective means campaigning to have another referendum because um, decisions as fundamental as that need to be taken by the people. And the politics are not there and I would, I would seriously not advise anyone uh, to campaign for that. But that's where the Tories want to have the conversation. It's much more difficult for them if you say you have failed at British performers and artists. I mean, it, it is extraordinary. This is one of our most successful industries and exports. We are brilliant at it. Art, drama, uh, music, technical expertise, technicians, roadies, you name it. And they have been comprehensively stuffed by the government's failure to look after their interests in the negotiations, which is why they're so cross. And the government doesn't really have an answer, apart from to say, well, we're trying to negotiate with individual member states on a little bit of easement here, there and everywhere. And it is a problem of the Home Office, actually. I mean, if DCMS isn't doing its job if it doesn't understand the problem. Uh, but it's all it's all been sacrificed on the altar of the Home Office's view of future immigration policy. Now, quite what risk to immigration policy a world famous uh, tenor coming over to the Royal Opera House for five nights to sing the lead role in Don Giovanni because the, the previously booked singer has come down with laryngitis escapes me. But that's, that, that's one of the practical examples that we are talking about or small businesses because we've been taking evidence on the impact on small businesses. And honestly, people are tearing their hair out with the paperwork, the cost, the bureaucracy, the uncertainty and Yesterday, I was on a call with representatives of the musical instruments industry. And one of the consequences of this is, um, if you go on a website to search for a piano or a microphone, uh, sellers in Europe now advertise a price excluding VAT because it's not their responsibility to collect VAT anymore. That's the responsibility of the UK. So what's happening is people are, are saying, well, that piano is 2,000 quid cheaper in, if I buy it from Germany than from the supplier in Britain. When the piano turns up at the door, it arrives with a whacking great VAT bill that they hadn't anticipated because they didn't check. They didn't realise that whereas previously the price included VAT from the 1st of January, it doesn't. So what are you going to do about that from a, uh, from a consumer point of view? How are you going to help uh, small uh, businesses? Now, the, one of the other difficulties at the moment is trying to disentangle uh, the effects of stocking prior to the end of the transition period, the effects of COVID, and the effects of the end of the transition period and leaving the single market in the customs union. And the government tries to say these are teething troubles. It's almost all over. That's what David Frost said the other day. These are not teething troubles. This is an endemic change which is bringing a real long-term problem. And we all continue to look at the trade figures as they come out. And so I, I see Labour's role as pointing this out and saying, we're doing this because we are speaking up for the people who have been affected adversely because of your 
failure in the negotiation to look after uh, their interests, because that makes it, in my view, much, much, much more difficult for the Tories to have the argument they like to have. We should have the argument on on our terms. And I would like to see the front bench doing more of that. In fairness, they have done uh, a bit so far. Not everybody notices, but they have. I agree with you. Uh, they've, they've done more than people have noticed, but yes, you know, the, the responsibility for that does lie with the party as much as it lies with the media. Uh, I think, but, but you're right, there's definitely more there than the, the caricature would suggest. Um, Pervez, I'll come to you, you've got a question. Oh, hello. Uh, uh, good afternoon, Ben. Uh, thank you for uh, your uh, lovely speech. Uh, my question is, of, you have already touched that a lot of small businesses are suffering. And of course, um, our previous speaker has uh, talked about uh, young people and, uh, you know, how uh, it will impact on their life. I think what we are expecting that a huge unemployment uh, uh, in young people in coming months and years. And do you, don't you think that Labour Party is reactive to all these challenges? And do you not suggest that we should be proactive of uh, making policies to tackle all these issues? I, I agree with you that we should. The, the position on unemployment is at the moment, it's not quite as bad as had been forecast at the start of the pandemic. If you look at the Bank of England forecast, they were saying by this time, we'd have a higher level of unemployment than we currently have. But what nobody knows is what will happen when furlough eventually unwinds and if and as and when all of the restrictions are removed, uh, and that's clearly not going to be on the 21st of June, judging by the briefing we've seen in the last couple of days and the announcement will be made on Monday, how many of those businesses that have been in suspended um, hibernation are going to be able to start functioning again and how many of them decide they can't and then they lay people off who have been supported by furlough and then we'll see that reflected in the unemployment figures. What I think the pandemic has opened up is it's made the case for government to act in ways certainly that we would never have thought a conservative government would have acted. If I'd said to you two years ago um, Rishi Sunak's going to pay the wages of nine million people in Britain because there's going to be a, a real economic problem at 80% of their previous earnings, up to £2,500 a month, you might have said to me, uh, I don't think that's going to happen. Now, it did happen because of the scale of the crisis. And in, in, a, in a way, that has moved the politics. It should move the politics in our direction. But of course, Boris Johnson is now a, an advocate of, of big spending, infrastructure, uh, um, putting money into the national health and other things uh, like that because he realizes it's quite popular and we we should actually keep a running tally of labor policies which were rubbished when we first advocated them that have in part been adopted by the Tories because there's quite a little list um, which shows that our thinking got there before theirs given the current circumstances but historically we have always been the party that is on the side of young people education training skills and I think the the thing we should focus on in in coming up with a an offer a policy is of course the change we have to make to get to zero carbon because this is the biggest question once the pandemic is dealt with or we find a way of living with it is we know what needs to be done it's very clear, we've got to get down to net zero. Uh, you can measure progress terribly easily, you just count. You count your emissions. It's like the reverse of a, a, a um, church steeple appeal, the thermometer, the money goes up. Well, this is the reverse. These are our emissions here and they're gonna to have to go down. And it's now that how do you make the practical steps? And if I just focus on one, every single gas boiler in the country is eventually gonna to have to go. Now, what's going to replace it? Will it be heat pumps? Will it require bigger radiators, internal insulation? Will it be hydrogen? 
If it's hydrogen, how do we produce enough hydrogen using electrolysis? Have we got enough renewable electricity? Who's going to make the boilers? Who's going to run the program to fit them in the houses? Um, now, there's huge opportunities here, particularly for workers in high carbon industries who are going to need to move into a different way of earning a living in the future. And people could see this coming, but they wanted a transition that is fair. And we are the party historically that has stood for fairness because dealing with climate change, getting to net zero cannot adversely impact on those who have least. And we should be making that argument very forcefully. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, right, last question of the day, we'll go to Ivor. Go ahead, Ivor. Sorry, just had to unmute myself. Um, first of all, thank you very much for this conference. It's been extremely enjoyable. And thank you very much, Mr. Ben. Uh, I've really enjoyed what you've said so far and found it very interesting. Uh, I also noticed that you said that Richie Sunak had, in a sense, parked his tanks on Labour's lawn, doing things you wouldn't have expected a, uh, a Conservative Chancellor to do. And I'm wondering if really that is part of a Conservative approach or what has been the Conservative approach uh, for some time that they're trying to um, occupy what might have been considered traditional labour territory in terms of social provision, but at the same time uh, aligning themselves to a, perhaps an internationalist right-wing movement and um, eating our bread, getting our voters on board with them. Um, I, also, I also noticed that uh, you said in our relationship with the European Union, we should perhaps take an incremental approach. And I was wondering if you could say something on what steps we should take and in what order to improve our um, relationship or to get a closer working relationship with the European Union. And at the same time, how we could perhaps change the, what I might call the labor mood music at the moment with regard to Europe. Because um, unfortunately, as we can see in the, in the, uh, in the current by-election, there is actually a, a pro-European candidate standing against a labor candidate, which obviously is a very, worrying movement, uh, development. So I, I'm just wondering uh, what your thoughts might be on how we can um, change the mood, mood music in the context of the Tories parking their tanks on our lawn and how we can uh, regain um, pro-European voters, especially with a, a general election probably coming up in 23 or 24. Well, we, we have to argue for a, a pragmatic, positive, relationship with our European neighbours. In a way, we have to get beyond the Brexit argument um, because, as I said earlier, the Tories want to carry on with the Brexit argument because they think that works for them with the new voters they have gained in what are called the red wall seats. And we have to change the conversation to the one that actually applies now. Brexit has happened how are we going to get along with our neighbours? Now, in any other circumstances, uh, countries, a, a grouping of countries, the EU and the United Kingdom, that are geographically very close, do a huge amount of trade with each other. You'd be talking about how you can do more trade and make trade easier. Now, what we've spent the last four and a half years doing is discussing how to make trade more difficult in the interests of what? Well, where are the, the big trade deals that are coming? I don't think it's going to be one with the American any anytime soon. And we all know that is going to only give us a certain amount of benefit compared to the loss we have suffered as a result of leaving the European Union. But I also think that we have to find solutions that recognise bluntly the red lines of either side at the moment. So if you take um, veterinary arrangements and food standards, since it's the current issue, the truth is, by and large, we are still producing all of our food to exactly the same standard as the rest of the European Union, um, uh, which we were on the 31st of December. It didn't change on the 1st of January. There's been some additional uh, changes the EU brought in in April. But it's, it seems to me that it would be perfectly possible to say, look, uh, to the EU, we are prepared to continue to operate to these standards for the time being. And if we decide in future we want to diverge from them in a way which you regard as unacceptable, then we will accept that things will have to change. But in the meantime, 
why can't we do this? And when it comes to adjudication, because the current government will never accept the remit of the European Court of Justice, and we have to recognize that, uh, let's find another way of doing that. In effect, it's doing for food standards and veterinary inspection arrangements exactly what was in the end agreed on the level playing field. And it's really instructive to look at the arrangements for managing the issue of a level playing field in the trade and cooperation agreement. Because in effect, it says either side can say, well, hang on a minute, what you're doing here, I think is unleveling the playing field. And then there's a range of steps that be, can be taken uh, unilaterally on either side to re-level the playing field, if that's what they feel like. And the advantage of that is that it makes it very clear to either side what the consequence of moving away from a rational, sensible alignment is. The government says, and we say we want the highest possible food standards. The EU says we want the highest possible food standards. Well, if we're all in agreement on the highest possible food standards, and if in practice we're all applying the highest possible food standards at the moment, well, why don't we have an agreement that that's what we're going to do in the interest of minimizing um, a very considerable proportion of the checks that are will be causing great difficulties uh, in Northern Ireland when the grace periods come to and then, and it may seem small, but in the process, you are establishing a new, uh, a new relationship, which says we're close, we have shared interests, let's find new ways of working together. And in the future, you could see a European Union, because I'm a great believer in what President Macron described as the, the union of concentric circles. That's what we were as Britain. We weren't in the Euro and we weren't in Schengen because we didn't want to be. So we were in a sort of outer concentric circle, but we had all of the benefits that came from being a member of the EU in other respects. And I think an EU which is prepared to accommodate different levels of involvement is going to be stronger in the decades ahead than one that says, uh, you know, you all, as new members, you all have to sign up to everything in detail. And by the way, we're on to ever closer, faster, deeper union, because my view, it's not everybody's view, but my view is I don't think that's where the politics of the existing member states is anyway. And so it's building that new relationship by realizing that the old one we had has gone because we lost and we've left. But it's now about building a new relationship. And I think that's a very positive message for those who feel, still feel very hurt and very upset, as we all do, about uh, what happened. But um, taking votes away from Labour in election and electing a Tory isn't going to help a sensible relationship being built with Europe, is it? No, it's not. Uh, that's true. Great. Uh, we will finish up there. We're slightly over time. Hilary, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. It's always a pleasure to have you and always a pleasure to hear from you. And, and uh, I know I speak for all of us, just one, you know, just in saying thank you so much for all the work that you've done over a number of years now and continue to do to bring some sanity to our relationship with the European Union and the political debate on this, you know, with, within the party and outside of the party as well. And I know that the commission that you're running will bear a great deal of fruit uh, in the future as this debate will inevitably move on from, from where it is at the moment, because at the moment it's, uh, it's give, particularly given the protocol, but not just the protocol. You know, you look at the, the, the labour shortages now, the fact that we've got enough hauliers, you know, the fact that hauliers are now talking about empty supermarket shelves and price rises. The, there are so many things that, that will, you know, move ahead over coming months and years and, and will need to be addressed by either this government, if it comes to its senses, or a more sensible government, hopefully Labour government, uh, in, in the not too distant future. And, uh, and I know a lot of the work that you do behind the scenes um, will, will have a big impact on that. So, so thank you. And thanks for joining us today. And thanks it's a pleasure. Yeah, great, good. I'm glad, I'm very, very glad indeed. And thanks for coming back so often. I'm very appreciative of that. Um, thanks to everybody else for joining today. It's been a really interesting day. I've learned a lot and, uh, and I've really appreciated your questions and comments. Um, and also I've learned a lot from, from speakers as well. So uh, we will be back in touch um, with info on um, 
future webinars over the next couple of months up until August, uh, and then plans from September onwards and plans for Labour Party conference, which fingers crossed will, will go ahead in September as well, depending on how things, how things go um, between now and then. Uh, in the meantime, enjoy the rest of your Saturday and your weekend and enjoy the, the warmer weather, which we, we now have at, at long last. And we'll see you all soon. Thanks again, Hilary. And thanks to any of our other speakers here. We're still on the call as well. See you all soon. Bye for now. Thanks, Mike. It was Cheers. great. Great. Good. Okay.